welcome. Thanks so much for joining this session. This is The Future of Food, presented by the Rochester Beacon. I'm Karen Heider, your host, standing by behind the scenes to help out if you do need help. We encourage you to type your questions in the chat panel and send them to hosts and panelists. I do want to turn things over to our host, Peter. Go ahead and begin when you're ready. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hello to all our viewers. I'm Peter Lovenheim, Washington correspondent for the Rochester Beacon. And I want to welcome everybody, both in Rochester and around the country, to today's event, which I think will be a dynamic and important conversation about the future of food. Here's the plan for today's event. I'll make a few remarks then introduce our panel and acknowledge our sponsors. Following that, we'll have about 30 minutes of moderated discussion with our panel members, um, and then open it up to your questions. Um, and please submit your questions uh, through chat. Please listen carefully as our menu options have changed. How many times have we heard that? But actually our food menu options in recent years have changed. Today we can eat burgers that look and taste like real meat, uh, but are made from pea protein. Uh, we can drink milk made from soybeans, almonds, or oats. Scientists tell us that soon we'll be able to eat actual meat uh, that has never touched a cow, but has been grown from cells in a laboratory. Or we'll be able to eat plant-based steak that, believe it or not, will be 3D printed. And I don't wanna gross anybody out, but there's at least one startup company working now to make mouse meat uh, from cultured cells. That would be to feed your cat. But is all this new food uh, healthy for us? Is it good for the planet? How will it affect local economies? And what else is coming down the pike? Uh, what is the future of food? Our panel today, if it were a restaurant, I'm sure would be rated five stars. <clears throat> they are Dr. David Littman. Dr. Littman is a biologist and former chief science officer for Impossible Foods. That's the company that makes the Impossible Burger. Dr. Littman worked on the groundbreaking Human Genome Project and was founding director of the National Center for Biotechnology Information at the National Institutes of Health. And a special interest for Rochester viewers, uh, yes, uh, David Lippmann's uh, family did found and run the popular longstanding Lippmann's Kosher Market in Brighton. We also have uh, Dr. Bruno Javier, Dr. Javier is a nationally recognized food scientist and associate director of the Food Venture Center at Cornell University. Before that, Dr. Javier uh, served as a professor of biotechnology and industrial microbiology at Federal University in his native Brazil. And finally, we have Dan Wise, an entrepreneur. Uh, Dan is founder and CEO of the startup company called Real Eats. Real Eats is a farm to table firm that each month ships prepared meals to tens of thousands of consumers in 31 states. A big thank you to our sponsors today. They are Arm Brewster Capital Management and Investment Advisor in Pittsburgh, New York, serving private institutional and corporate clients. Lamar Advertising, among the world's largest outdoor advertising companies, and Canandaigua National Bank, the only local full service community owned financial institution in Greater Rochester. And we also wanna thank you for joining us today. The Rochester Beacon is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, digital source of news and commentary. And we thank you and our sponsors for helping support healthy local journalism. So let's get started. Uh, David Lippmann, uh, as a biologist and someone who's recently worked in the uh, private sector, when you think about the future of food, what do you see? 
Well, hopefully we see dramatically fewer animals in the food system because they are a major contributor to climate change. Um, and, uh, uh, and reciprocally, climate change is having a major impact on our ability to grow the food that we need. So, uh, so that's a real challenge for us. Um, but I believe I'm confident that we can create foods that uh, people choose instead of animals in the food system. And, uh, and so I think we're gonna see a lot of exciting new foods available uh, that are nutritious, that are affordable um, and delicious. So that's where I see the future of food going. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Bruno, um, as a food scientist, uh, I'm curious, what is it that I'm gonna see in my refrigerator five or 10 years from now that I can't even imagine today? When we say the future of food, what do you foresee? So Peter, uh, so thank you for, for having me in this panel. Uh, congratulations on, on the work that you do at the Rochester Beacon. Uh, of course, that's a very, uh, uh, it's daring to respond to that question with, with some uh, ideas about the future. Um, usually food trends change every generation. I think what we have seen in the past uh, 20 years or so is, is when you look at history, it's, it's an exception. Often we learn how to eat from our, most, most often our uh, mothers, uh, uh, our grandmothers, and, and we tend to eat the same things and change a little bit. And you still see a little bit of that. When we are trying to make new uh, uh, sources of protein, make steaks using new sources of protein, we're still addressing our desire, our tradition to eat something uh, that it, it looks familiar, right? So I, I don't anticipate or I wouldn't bear anticipating something extravagant in terms of uh, new foods. But I do think that we will see a big change in where these foods are coming from and where they're composed, uh, they're, they're constituted of, the ingredients on those foods. I think there is a strong tendency uh, to reduce uh, some uh, chemical com uh, constituents in, in some foods, especially preservatives and uh, some color additives. I think we will continue to see that trend. I think we will also, uh, I think this trend in th of focusing too much on protein, by the way, I, I think that's going to pass. I think this is uh, um, <clears throat> something that the industry is taking advantage of right now, but I think very soon we will see the need to address our uh, uh, need to have more fiber in, in our diet. But anyways, uh, mm -hmm. what I think is most important is, is that we will see technology uh, solving the biggest problems in the food sector, which is logistics, traceability, and sourcing uh, of foods and ingredients that address these needs. Okay, thanks, Bruno. And uh, Dan Wise, you're you're dealing with, uh, with a consumer clientele, providing tens of thousands of meals to people every month already through Real Eats. I'm curious, when you think about the future of food, where do you see consumer tastes moving in the years to come? First and foremost, thanks for having me here. I very much appreciate it and glad to be part of this panel. Um, I believe that the future of food is really all about solving for health and climate crises that are that we're facing today. And food, of course, has an important role in that. But I do see that being challenged um, by the kind of need to satisfy consumer demand and preferences at the same time as having an exponentially growing population. I think we've been prioritizing consumption, convenience, efficiency, profitability um, for, for decades now. And this has kind of given rise to a food system that generally outputs an abundance of accessible, often lower quality, and in many cases, unhealthy foods. This is leading to disease like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, um, cancer, and all of which have some type of a link to diet. So I, I see the future um, of food trying to solve for that and for the climate crisis in the way that we produce and we transport food. I think eliminating food waste is a really, really big piece of this. Um, currently, we, we waste 40% of all the food that we produce around the world. And this creates a whole lot of methane and landfills and, and so forth. So in the future, um, we need to solve for those things. And I think there will continue to be strong demand for foods that do that, that protect our health, um, and that are sort of more efficient in production. Um, foods that are used for wellness, I think there will 
be more and more consumer demand for flexibility of choice and dietary personalization. That's something that we're seeing a lot of in, in the real eats business. Um, I think that convenience will continue to be a, a very strong theme um, to support people's busier and busier lifestyles. And uh, in a pandemic or post-pandemic world, consumers will likely place a lot more importance on hygiene and knowing where food is sourced from as well. Okay, uh, uh, you raised a number of points about health and climate. Um, one question I'm not clear on is, uh, I think you all raised the issue that maybe plant-based foods are healthier for people. And yet my experience is most people like to eat what's familiar. How, uh, how does the industry get people to be less wary of foods they've never heard of before? Anybody want to try that one? I mean, I think, I think we have, go ahead, David. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the things that we see, and I, I, I heard this in uh, both Dan and Bruno's uh, um, intro, um, you know, food changes incrementally. When, we, when we're looking at a new food, we have to be able to sort of categorize it as something, oh, that's a burger. Um, that's, uh, and, and for many foods, um, what we're seeing now is that there are many more categories now. So, uh, you know, it used to be there was just soy milk available now, and it was not in, in the cooler section. And now when you go over to the refrigerated section, there's an incredible range of uh, plant-based uh, uh, beverages and combinations of them. So um, I think that, uh, uh, and one of the important things I think that Beyond and Impossible have done is that they have opened people up to try more different things. We're, see, we're gonna see more and more. So I think what you're saying is, what uh, Dan has said and what you're saying is true. You know, We have to have this um, feeling of comfort. We have to recognize what we're gonna eat, okay? It has to look like something. We have to have names for it that make sense to us. Um, uh, but on the other hand, that is evolving. And in fact, of course, the way people have eat, have eat around the world has evolved tremendously. And if you just think in terms of the range of cuisines and what are the most popular foods in America now and compare that to what was popular a few decades ago, there's a dramatic change. So, um, uh, so while I think that uh, we have to do this incrementally, uh, ev evolution of food tastes has, has been you know, pretty profound over the last uh, number of decades. So what if I'm a guy who's just happy with my steak and potatoes? I mean, why do I have to be uh, presented with, with all these food innovations if I'm, if, if, I'm, if I'm happy with my current diet? I mean, if you're asking me, what I would say is that, there's, that, that, that it's known in the market that there are those people who are very adventurous. Then there's a sector of the, of the market which... Uh, uh, are not the earliest adopters, but are also more open. And then there are people who are very resistant um, and, uh, you know, they're going to be the last ones to change if at all. Uh, on the other hand, um, if food is good enough and there are actually quantitative ways to test that um, and the prices are right and the nutritional properties are good and, you know, and we do a good job of marketing it and so forth, um, uh, it's perceived as being healthy. Uh, then, uh, then we see increasing uh, uh, uptake. Okay. Where does but we will never force you, Peter? <laughs> where Where does the funding for all this innovation come from? Is is um, is private industry uh, sufficient to to make the innovations that you're all advocating? I mean, do we need government to step in at some point? Anybody want to take that? Well, Peter, I think uh, the, the, the point that uh, is, is the first thing to be acknowledged is that the government does have a, a very strong presence, presence and plays a tremendous role in deciding what we eat. That's, that's a reality. Uh, we will have the discussions on the farm bill uh, and talking about that again every year that happens and where the money is allocated into the agriculture. Uh, sector. It goes way beyond farms, of course, um, and, and that's something that we should be aware of. So the, the prices on the, uh, on the grocery stores are severely determined by that and trade agreements and, and so on and so forth. 
uh, government does take, have a role here uh, because, for example, if we're discussing the environmental impact of food production, uh, either we will prevent that impact from happening or we will need to get together through government to fix the consequences. So, of course, preventing it is a lot cheaper and, and that's part of the reason why we are looking for alternatives. Uh, and I saw someone mentioning on the chat here, uh, why do we need new foods? Well, maybe I am a, I'm very happy, happy eating a, a steak and potatoes. Uh, I try to eat less. Um, I don't need new foods, but we do. Uh, either we as ourselves, our current generations, or the generations of our children, our grandchildren, and so on. So there are many reasons why we should consider uh, 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 discussing more about the government involvement in this and ask questions such as, should the government continue funding uh, uh, some type of activities that have a bigger impact on the environment or on the water supply than others? And we will pay one way or the other. Either we pay less now or more later. Uh, Dan, while we're talking about the climate, I think we've all read about uh, methane emissions being due in large part to to, to cattle. Uh, is that correct? And if, if so, do we need to get rid of all the cows and cattle? Okay. Peter, are you asking me that question? No, I, actually, I, I wanted to ask uh, Bruno that question if I could. Okay. Uh, so I hope we can uh, find a, a, a solution that will respect in, in, uh, people's individualities. I, I, I hope that that we'll have that option. Currently, we do. I do not think that we are in a scenario where we have to just say, you know, lock down on meat. We're we, uh, uh, safely far from that. But I think the measurement of, the, of how smart a civilization is, is their ability to act preemptively. So how do we prevent such situations from ever happening? And I think we don't need to radicalize the discussion. I think we have to be respectful, understand, be inclusive. In all uh, uh, sorts, uh, in all situations here. So no, I do not think that we will get to that. I really hope. I am a scientist. I believe that we can uh, 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 work towards a situation where I will be able to have my steak, uh, 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 and I will also be able to have fried cassava uh, once in a while. But flying that to, to from Brazil to here is not going to be my smartest choice. Dan, uh, did you want to jump in on that? You know, I just, I think that there's um, also an emphasis that just needs to be placed on the c consumption and overconsumption of food. So the overconsumption kind of resulting in food waste. And I think that we can, you know, have our steaks once in a while, but I don't think that we should be eating steaks all the time. I think that there's a uh, propensity to kind of indulge in a lot of foods that don't make a whole lot of sense for the for the environment. But the worst part about it from, you know, the perspective I come from is to see the tremendous amount of food waste that's in the food system, right? So with all that food waste that ends up traveling, you know, many miles with a very large carbon footprint and ending up somehow in a landfill or 40% of all the food that we eat ending up in a landfill creating methane. I think that this just has a, a, tr a tremendous, tremendous impact. So while there's, you know, a lot of funding for new foods that are very important, and I believe that plant-based foods uh, are a very important part of a healthier food future. Um, at the same time, you know, there is also government funding for old foods, and that's something that really has sort of been a beneficiary of. We've been able to create a situation where we have portion-controlled foods, um, that are made from whole ingredients that are highly nutritious, but, you know, there's not a massively large portion and our packaging format allows us to control food waste. And the government has stepped up at the city level, the county level, the state level, and, and helped to fund a program like that as well. So I think there's lots of ways to kind of skin the cat, if you will, but um, certainly I would imagine that at the end of the day, um, people will definitely still need to eat a whole lot less beef for there to be a, su a sustainable situation relative to our environment. All right. Uh, I just I'd like to, to I just, sorry. please, Peter, sure. I, 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 uh, I see a thread of, 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 of comments that, that um, where people, some people are worried, you know, are we going to be forced to eat differently and whatever? Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear 
that uh, the way that we shift our food choices, um, it's choices. We have to provide better choices. We have to provide, and, and, uh, uh, and the issue of the role of the government, as uh, I, I think Bruno mentioned, I mean, there's huge government subsidies for certain, for dairy, for other kinds of, of foods. And, uh, and that does have an impact on what foods we eat and what they cost us and, and even the kinds of, you know, the, the nutritional properties of them. Um, so, and I also saw comments about, well, you know, we're, we're being pushed to eat very salty, sugary foods and so forth. And, you know, obviously food companies have determined from their research and from their marketing work of what seems to sell and so forth. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we see changes, for example, there's been a shift in America away from beef more towards chicken. And that was because uh, the prices were better, people perceived chicken as being healthier and so forth. So we can, we can make changes that are not happening because anybody's forcing you, but rather because um, we're providing better alternatives. And, um, and uh, on that point, the reason why people bring up beef so often is that beef is just much, much more inefficient and much more damaging to the environment. It's not just the dramatic amount of water it takes for every pound of beef. It's not just the impact in terms of methane, as you mentioned. Um, uh, it's not just the fact that, they, that uh, we have to feed them so much more grain to put on weight and, and to make protein than, than, for example, poultry, it's a factor of five or more difference. Um, uh, or, or just being able to eat grains directly. Um, it's also things like what they call gray water, that uh, not only are cows using much more water, but they're polluting our water, and we have to deal with that as well. And, and also, uh, we have issues in terms of uh, uh, foodborne outbreaks that come from uh, uh, animals uh, and, and, and come from uh, uh, antibiotics that are being fed to the animals, so we have much more antibiotic resistance. So I think that this issue of, of beef being a problem is, is real and, and, and animals in general. Uh, but I also think on the other hand, it's not gonna happen because we, that, that somehow people are forced to have alternatives. We have to make and we can make alternatives that they choose. So, so how, how would a switch in, in consumer tastes as you're suggesting affect, for example, the, the economy in central and Western New York which is, uh, is one of the national centers for the dairy industry. I mean, if more people start drinking uh, plant-based milk and eat plant-based burgers, um, what effect is that gonna have on all the people who make their livings in the dairy industry here? Well, you have to look at the total system, and Peter, and that is that uh, you know, certain crops that we're growing now and other, like the Central Valley of California because of droughts and so forth, we're gonna to have to be shifting around what we grow, where we grow it. And so I see tremendous opportunities in areas like uh, Western upstate New York because there's more water, that's one thing. Uh, so for agriculture, not just animal-based, um, but also um, innovation like uh, what's going on at Cornell and what Dan and, and his company are doing in Geneva, these are things that, uh, uh, that will create new jobs and hopefully better jobs uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the folks in Western New York State. Well, what's an example of a new kind of job that any of you are imagining? If I can make some comments on that, uh, Peter, well, the new jobs exist already. We uh, see uh, even farms. Uh, one good example is Elmhurst. Uh, they switch from uh, 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 dairy to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, oat-based uh, uh, beverages. And uh, so these opportunities to take advantage of the trends exist for everyone. Okay, so new jobs exist. Uh, uh, and I, I would give it an example, right? Uh, we switched the, the way, the means we, of transportation. Uh, we have the railroad tycoons and those guys are no longer railroad tycoons. Some of them switched. They saw themselves as transportation tycoons and they invested in other technologies. I think some dairy farmers in some dairy facilities are seeing themselves as manufacturers of food of a certain type, and they're switching based on the trends and, and uh, adjusting based on the, the abilities they already have. Uh, I think the technologies exist, the, uh, uh, the availability exists, and there is an opportunity for these farmers to take advantage of it. And when I say take advantage, you have to remember that uh, 
well, they are not making a lot of money, right? We see farmers struggling. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Well, a lot of the money that we uh, make by selling milk, to simplify the example, go into buying the fuels that come from who knows where, comes from buying uh, uh, fertilizers that come from Eastern Europe. And switching the technologies may give you an opportunity to create a, 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 a business that will give you a better profit and it will be better for the region because we don't rely so much on imported uh, uh, implements and goods and so on. So I think there's a huge opportunity for both the individuals and the region as well. Okay. Uh, Peter, Peter, if I could chime in there, I could give you a little, a small, you know, a short little case study on, you know, job creation in upstate New York. And I, I, I you know, I don't want to talk just about real aids, but it's the story that I know firsthand. Um, and that is that, you know, we were given an opportunity um, through public funding from the city, the county, the state, to open up a kitchen in upstate New York. Food tech companies are typically located in, you know, on the East Coast, you know, Brooklyn, Manhattan are some of the places you would typically find a food tech company. I never envisioned that we would land in upstate New York. But the progressive nature of the different public sector entities have been instrumental to bring companies like Real Eats to that region and to create jobs and good jobs. Um, we have become, you know, the second largest employer in the town of Geneva, which desperately needed jobs and continues to need jobs. Um, we don't know the exact numbers, but there are indirect jobs created from, you know, a business like Real Eats and some of the other food tech companies as well in the region and their service jobs, their agricultural jobs, um, and so forth. So I think that, you know, when there's a private public type of collaboration, similar to like what we have, and when the government steps in and as, as progressive as uh, the New York State and Ontario County and Geneva City governments are, um, good things can happen in terms of employment in underserved agricultural regions. So, so Dan, I, I had the opportunity to be one of your to become one of your customers recently. I ordered four entrees from Real Eats that were shipped to uh, where I'm currently living in in uh, Maryland, um, and and it was delicious. I think I had the General Tso's tofu with maybe a ginger sauce, if I remember. Um, but I was struck by the packaging because what uh, each component of that that meal was separately vacuum sealed in a plastic package. And then there were multiple ice packs contained in the box and then the box itself. And the whole thing was shipped 500 miles, I think from Geneva, New York to Chevy Chase, Maryland. So in terms of environmental impact, I was just curious, um, how, do we, how do we address that where we, when we're trying to to, to better distribute some of these new types of foods? Are we not just creating another environmental issue with packaging and shipping? Yeah, I think meal delivery is an area that is, you know, needs, that, that has a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. We're not happy with the use of plastic. I don't think anybody really is. I will say, however, we have on the lower plastic or maybe even the lowest plastic profile or footprint, let's call it, in the meal delivery space. But um, we're always looking for ways to maybe eventually find a biodegradable polymer that actually is heat resistant so that it can do exactly what um, our current packaging does. But with this said, um, you know, the plastic does play a role and it's an important role. And we'd like to replace the plastic, although we'd like the role to continue. And that is that it's highly portable right? It locks in the flavor, the freshness, and the nutrition of real food. And it allows for us to ship it to consumers where it stays fresh in their fridge for about seven days. And then it can be frozen in the same packaging. You know, we all have great intentions when we go to the grocery store and we buy our ingredients. Um, but, you know, quite often those ingredients go to waste, right? This is one way to significantly reduce food waste when you know, we have this opportunity to kind of lock in these ingredients um, in a way that doesn't even use preservatives or what have you. And if you can, in fact, reduce food waste in a significant way, which as we talked about earlier, is a 40% problem for, you know, 40% of all the food we produce, what happens? 
what happens is you can reduce packaging consumption, right? And this is a really important point that we, we need to make because if there wasn't a way of reducing that food waste, um, we would continue to use more, you know, 40% more packaging than we actually need to use. So while I don't think that this is the answer or the, the end answer or the end game, um, it's created a beginning for us to be able to contribute to reducing food waste, reducing packaging consumption. And um, I'm hopeful that there are better, more biodegradable alternatives in the future. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. You mentioned uh, ingredients of many of these new innovative foods. And that gets me to a question I want to, I want to pose. Um, Karen, if we could have that slide from uh, Beyond Burger put up. Um, because here's, here's my concern. The, the trend in recent decades among people who think about food consumption is that we want to eat more natural foods closer to the earth. We want to know what we're eating, farm to table. And yet when I look at a lot of the new innovative foods, such as the plant-based burgers, um, they're, they're, they're highly processed as far as I can see. They have ingredients that we're not maybe familiar with and many of the ingredient, ingredients themselves have been highly processed. If we're making burgers out of pea protein, you have to extract the protein from the pea, I think, to get there. So is there a kind of tension between, on the one hand, our desire to eat more naturally, and on the other hand, to embrace some of these food innovations? Uh, uh, well, let's food. be clear, when you're eating a burger, the, what's going into that burger is a heck of a lot of things, right? It doesn't, it, it, it just has to say beef, but what goes in it, well, we know that there, there are, uh, you know, antibiotics that they fed those animals. Um, we know that there are, uh, uh, in some cases, there have been in, in recent past uh, hormones and, and, and growth hormones and things like that, um, uh, you know, uh, and there are many compounds uh, in, 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 in beef and in other animals that we know as we cook them, that can be very unhealthy as well. Um, but I think that this point that you're making about, um, you know, let's look at the set of ingredients, how complex is it, look at all the things. The real question is, are the components going in there that are unhealthy? And are we losing certain nutrients that are really important in terms of the process? What does processing mean? I mean, oat flakes, oatmeal is processed, okay? There's okay. a number of things that have to happen to an oat growth before it can become uh, a, a usable uh, oatmeal flake, okay? Uh, it, it will get rancid very quickly if certain things happen, happen to it and so forth. So we've been processing foods forever. The issue is, is that process uh, harming the environment? Is that process uh, taking out nutrients we need? Is it, is it adding things that we really don't want to eat? Um, all of that said, I'm very excited about the notion of coming up with traditional innovative foods. What is the new uh, tofu, the new tempeh, the new seitan that, you know, there, there, we, we can create foods that um, retain almost all the nutrients of the original food and, and really um, uh, strike a note of, of the kind of traditional foods we've eaten and yet could be um, more convenient, more, more tasty and so forth. So I see uh, a number of directions where the innovation is not to uh, go to directly to protein concentrates and isolates and all the rest, but to do things that are more gentle to the original product, but create foods that people really like. Okay, uh, Bruno is a food scientist. Uh, do you wanna jump in on that one? Well, honestly, I'm, I'm having so much fun looking at the 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 chat here that I got distracted with with the answers here, <laughs> but the fact is, well, the, is that my question was: Are we taking a step backwards in terms of our um, interest in eating natural foods when we eat highly processed? Uh, oh, the processing question. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm totally on, on the same page with with David. You know, uh, I so some people. Make, go to great lengths to purchase uh, raw milk. It's allowed in some states. And the first thing that they do when they get home is uh, uh, boil the milk, the milk right before they eat because that's how they, they're used to, to, to do it. 
uh, when we buy fresh vegetables, you buy fresh broccoli and you go to great lengths to buy that very cheap bro broccoli. And then some people, the first thing that they would do is put a ton of butter on top and, and bake it. So that's processing. So you're processing the food. It's, it's either is, uh, is you doing it or other people doing it. Of course, if you buy a head of lettuce and eat the fresh product directly, then you're comparing a fresh product versus a non-processed product. So in, in many situations, I think David is right on the ball. Uh, we are comparing things that do not uh, really uh, make sense. But can we reduce the processing? In some situations, we can. And in some situations, that will lead to an increase in the, the nutritional quality of the product. And I think the most important thing uh, question sometimes is, can we remove some ingredients that have uh, a smaller health benefit? For example, can we reduce the amount of calories in comparison to the amount of fiber or protein or vitamins that we want to have in the product. So those improvements can be made and uh, uh, is always a trade-in. Will the food last longer? Will, will, will it have a less, uh, lesser impact on, prod, on, on, on the environment if I make those changes? Thanks, Bruno. Um, before we go to some viewer questions, I want to ask you one other, one other question I've been, I've been thinking about, which is a lot of these innovative foods, I think, tend to cost more than their traditional counterparts whether it's a plant-based burger. Um, I just saw that there's a company making 3D plant-based burgers uh, now, and they're being sold only in the, uh, like 25 of the, of the most uh, expensive European restaurants. So my question is, how, how do these food innovations help people who are on more limited budgets and don't have that kind of discretionary income to spend on innovative, maybe even healthier foods. Is there kind of an elitist quality about some of this food innovation? Oh, open to anybody. Dan, maybe you have a thought on that. Yeah, yeah listen, I, I think like any new innovation, um, the infancy of the product life cycle usually caters to early adopters. And those early adopters are typically more affluent consumers initially on, on, on the averages. So then, uh, you know, as more people buy in, um, you know, the product gets more mainstreamed. Costs, prices, and consumption become sort of more ubiquitous. Um, but the bigger issue there is sort of like until companies, small ones like, like ours, <laughs> reach scale, especially in the, in the food industry, it's really challenging to get those prices down. Mm -hmm. So reaching scale is actually really expensive. Trust me, I know. <laughs> it's really expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, our, you know, even our product is a little bit more premium in nature. It's slightly more expensive than our, our larger competitors. Um, but I also would like to just draw attention to another kind of like adjacent part of this and, and or, you know, that kind of relates to this. And that is that um, healthy, real, nutrient-dense ingredients, um, and whether they're processed, slightly processed, or whole foods or what have you, are just more expensive. Right. And until I think our society starts valuing the importance of food and quality food in our lives, um, you know, they're going to these these foods are going to just continue to be expensive when higher quality foods in general become more mass marketized or more, you know, mainstreamed. I think we will see potentially more demand, more you know people providing supply, and subsequently prices will come down on the average. So I uh, I hope that that's the way that okay. this goes. You know, that would be my answer. So, to so that Peter, one. I want to address the cost thing because I think there's a couple aspects that. All right, and then I want to go to viewer questions. You're not in charge here, Peter. <laughs> uh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, you know the thing. The thing here is that. Um, uh, one aspect of, of price with a new product is actually a marketing thing. If you, if you can um, come across to the top chefs and, and, and you are um, really getting the most adventurous and, and actually vocal uh, foodies in the beginning, that's an advantage. And so to some extent, you know, going in as a kind of a, a niche product um, uh, and sort of building up momentum, there are advantages with that. Okay, so that can be a marketing direction. And we've seen a real drops in some of the plant-based meats and so forth. Uh, but in addition, um, the price of foods is very much of a systems thing. So uh, as Bruno brought up, there's tremendous government subsidies uh, for some, you know, for some food products that affects price. Um, 
but it also takes time um, to develop the ecosystem around new foods such that you can use everything that goes into it. So if you're going to be producing, um, uh, say, extracting protein from peas or from soy or whatever, the side streams from the soybeans or the peas um, uh, can be made into something which is also part of the food system. And so all of that uh, contributes to reduction in cost. And that takes, that takes time. Uh, I think we're seeing decreases right now, but absolutely in principle, if we cut the animals out of the food system, all right, we can create foods that are much more affordable and at the same time uh, uh, nutritious uh, and delicious. So, I, I mean, you know, the cow does not get better. The, the chicken has actually gotten worse in terms of taste, um, but we can actually make plant-based and non-animal based foods better tasting and more nutritious all the time. Okay, great, great answer, David. And um, I wanted to ask Karen if we have some questions from viewers at this point. We do, Peter. Actually, we have one that seems really relevant, and that is, what promise does the future of food and food innovation hold for addressing global hunger and malnutrition? So can I take that? Sure. So, Peter, uh, uh, thank you. I think Elisa asked that question. And, and for me, it's the most relevant point. I think a lot of the discussions that we have here, and, and again, uh, please forgive me uh, 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 if, because I, as I said, I am a foreigner. This is not a, a, co uh, a, crit a criticism to our culture, to our country here. Uh, I came from Brazil, and, and uh, uh, so I, I have a, a firsthand perception of what the issue is, you know, uh, in Brazil, we have about 30% of the population right now not having enough uh, uh, food on their table and, and the situation is getting worse by the time. And, and it's not the worst place in the, in the world right now. So I think a lot of the questions that we are discussing here are questions of privilege. And I think we have just to acknowledge that and understand that there are others that need to be addressed. Uh, we should have a uh, uh, you know, a broad uh, vision, perception of the issues at hand. And in terms of what the impact of what we are discussing here today on the future of foods, I do see that uh, uh, when we have better technologies and access to plant-based proteins, for example, would solve immediate problems of malnutrition. Uh, we have plants with an increased level of vitamin B12 and other vitamins that lead to uh, uh, very important nutritional deficiencies in children all over the, 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 the world, I think that would have a tremendous impact. And there are some examples of that already, such as golden rice and some sweet potatoes. Cornell has now a cassava uh, a program. And the goal here is to improve the quality of this plant to help uh, uh, address these issues of malnutrition, which is one thing, and also hunger, right? Uh, solving hunger is not necessarily... Uh, just eating more food is not going to uh, necessarily solve malnutrition. And we have so many people here in the United States that are malnourished, but they are uh, uh, obese, right? So we have to address those two things. And, and it leads to what we discussed before about the density and the quality, nutritional quality of these ingredients and food products. Thank you, Bruno. Um, anybody else want to jump in on that? Or should we take another question? Well, there, there actually were some... Uh, I agree with uh, Bruno, the, the uh, comments on the side are fascinating. It's, I have to keep myself from looking at them. Uh, but people have brought up uh, that one of the things the, that, that uh, can lead to lower prices is, is uh, you know, a really, you know, high pressure squeeze on people in the system, people who work in the food business. You know, there's a, a terrific book called um, The Hidden Life of Groceries which really goes into that. If you look at how shrimp coming from uh, overseas farm shrimp, what, what's behind that, or uh, 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 I think the meat racket it's called was one on Tyson's and how the verticalization of uh, the poultry business and who got squeezed there. And if you look in a lot of these systems, um, there, there are incredibly fragile parts of the system. We know in, you know, in the in early days with COVID that uh, there were problems with pork and meat supply because um, the conditions working in the uh, processing facilities there uh, were such that people were, were you know, were getting ill and it's, uh, there's, you know, high risk jobs there. Um, if you look uh, for uh, ranchers, 75% uh, of the people who are raising the early stage of cattle 
uh, have other jobs. It's a, they can't they can't support themselves doing that work. If you look at the uh, poultry business, uh, the the farmers who who are raising the chickens, all they own is the farm and the and the chicken house. Everything else is owned by these big businesses, and they are squeezed so much in terms of their margins that they're going out of business all the time, and they're only kept going because of subsidies subsidized uh, uh, loans uh, from the U.S. government. So, um, you know, I think an important aspect of, of our current system where prices are kept down in, in, in many places, the, those prices that, that, that make the food more affordable for us are also making life really difficult for the people who are part of that system. We have to be aware of that. The truckers, for example, the truckers who are essential for this um, have really been squeezed over the last number of years. So, so I think some great uh, uh, comments and questions uh, and, and I think it's impressive to see the, the level of awareness uh, that uh, this audience has. Really, they should be the ones in the panel, I think. We have a very sophisticated audience at the Rochester Beacon, David. Peter, can I just chime in on that just sure. a touch as well? I think it's a, such an important question. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to beat on the, the food waste drum here for just a little bit longer. And that is to say that if we are wasting 40% of the food that we produce around the world, then we are only 60% efficient, right? We're getting a yield of 60% out of the production process and the distribution process and everything that goes behind getting ingredients into, you know, converted into food and meals and, you know, delivered to consumers ultimately, or just ingredients by themselves. And that means that we are overspending by 40% in terms of costing, right? If, if we could attack that aspect of it, and if food, you know, so much of it gets wasted in transit as well, right? So if food that's coming from faraway places, other countries, you know, gets spoiled in transit, gets here, by the time it's here, it's non-usable at either the grocery store level or the consumer level, right? It's, it's a real shame considering not just, you know, the costing, but the carbon footprint and that somebody in that country that perhaps, you know, originally grew that food or was part of the production team at a farm somewhere is not getting that food or that other people in that same country are not getting that food. So I would see like a future that kind of tries to relocalize the food system to some degree. And I think that we can curb a lot of those extra costs and feed a lot more people. All right, thanks, Dan. By the way, I, I want you to know that when I when I ordered my real eats dinners, I did not waste forty percent of any of them. I ate them all; they were delicious. <laughs> Good Karen, stuff. Do we, have, do we have another question for the panel? Yes. One is: Do you know of any nutritional advantage of meat protein grown in plants as opposed to simply eating a plant based diet with protein complementarily? Uh, meat protein grown in plants. I, I, there may be a misconception in the question to some extent, but I think she's actually asking that that is whoever put that is, is an excellent question. The healthiest thing we all know is to, you know, eat, you know, foods that uh, uh, we've not changed. You know, it's, 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 it's rice and beans and nuts and, you know, you know, whole grains and, and whatever else. And we can eat, we, we know, uh, that we can eat a healthy diet without eating any animal-based products. It, it takes more, you know, it takes a little more preparation work. Um, and, and, and yet, uh, even though, you know, you can go and have delicious meals that way, um, people still want protein-dense foods. And that's been a trend throughout history. And so the challenge is, uh, you know, getting people educated so many choose that uh, very healthy you know, complementary uh, uh, plant proteins and so forth type of diet, but also to create healthy um, uh, and delicious, convenient uh, 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 foods as well. Like uh, what actually what Dan is trying to do as well. We have to we have to meet the needs of the consumers um, and get that get give them the choices that they need to do do better. Wait, so so I I want to follow up on that question. I'm not sure I I fully understood it. But I do have a question I think this is related. So is it healthier to eat an actual meat burger from a cow versus eating a meat burger that was grown from cell cultures in a laboratory? 
So we, we, we have no real experience at this point uh, yeah. with the cell-based meats. I mean, it, you know, we're, it's going to take time before those are out there and we can really understand that. And, and what I would say is that, uh, you know, when I was at Impossible, we were not, or at least I was not saying the Impossible Burger is something you should be eating every single day. I mean, uh, a burger, I don't care what, you know, what it, you know, what it comes from is not going to be as healthy as this option that somebody mentioned about, uh, you know, whole grains and, and, and vegetables and so forth, uh, where you complement it and, and, and make, make something like that. It's a treat to have a burger. Um, and if we treated burgers as this treat, uh, then uh, we would be eating less of it. Uh, and, uh, and we would be, you know, and whether it's a plant-based one or not. Um, but, uh, uh, but one of the comments that I was responding to before is that we're just seeing the first generations of plant-based meats that people that are good enough that meat eaters will try them. And, uh, and we can make that healthier and healthier. We can improve the fat content. We can reduce the salt. There's a number of things that we can make sure that they have more, uh, inherent fiber and so forth. Um, uh, but the cow is not going to get any better. The cow is not going to get healthier. David, I, I just have to point out that your remarkable personal history going from your your family's kosher meat market when you were a kid, and I think you told me that you used to work there, to going to Impossible Foods, helping create as a scientist, the second generation of the plant-based Impossible Burger. I mean, it's just a great story. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. I appreciate that. I, I, I've enjoyed all of those experiences. It wasn't always easy working for my dad, though. He was a pretty tough guy. But, uh, uh, but I would say that uh, um, for, I, I ate great meat growing up. And when I went to college and I went to the cafeteria and I tasted the food, I said, ooh, this is not going to work for me. And within a few years, I just stopped eating beef. And it was really primarily because I was so spoiled at home. And when I came home from the first vacation and I told my dad, you know, I'm not going to eat beef anymore. I said, and this is a guy who ate literally, he ate meat three times a day. Uh, he lived to 82, uh, but he ate me three times a day. And when I told him that, he said, I could see that. <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> hey, Karen, I think we maybe have time for one more question. Here's one. Oh, actually, I lost it on my slide. Okay. Uh, Larry asks, to address worldwide hunger, can these healthier foods be grown and produced using less water? since so many areas of hunger suffer from drought. Bruno, what do you think? You're a food scientist. And let me take that because I mentioned uh, 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 this on the chat here too. Uh, absolutely. And that's where research is needed. Okay. And I will go, go back a little bit further. Okay. I don't think it's easy to argue against the importance of uh, humans being, becoming able to eat highly, concentration, highly concentrated diets in terms of nutrients and fats and energy uh, and the role that it played on our evolution. The reason why our brain developed over time was because we had access to a diversified and very uh, nutritious diet. Animal-based uh, foods took a tremendous uh, uh, role in that. It's not easy to argue that we would have been able to do the same, to evolve that way without access to uh, meat from animals, okay? Uh, in, in the scientific community, community, of course, the debate is, is open. However, the most important point is, I don't think that with the technology that we have nowadays, with big brains like we developed over these 150,000 years, we wouldn't be able to create these diets. Okay, I think that that's very important. And that's exactly what they did at Impossible Foods and so many others are doing in other companies as well. And we do have some projects like that uh, uh, here at Cornell, very exciting stuff and invite everyone to reach out to us and we do tours of the pilot plant. You can get some uh, knowledge of what's going on here. But to address your question, Peter, I mentioned in the chat the uh, cassava project uh, that is going on at Cornell. We got, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, I, I mean, it doesn't matter, but we got funding uh, uh, from international and national uh, uh, resources to provide that. And of course, we don't grow cassava in the United States, but cassava is an emerging crop exactly because of the uh, uh, very small need of water. And wait, the, wait, the wait, goal. Remind me, is cassava a fruit or a vegetable? Oh, <laughs> cassava is a root. Okay, mm -hmm. very, uh, yeah, is, is a root. 
and starch rich and it doesn't have a very great content in some vitamins for example so we could have projects improving the vitamin the content in uh, um, b12 for example and that's the kind of projects that are being made creating seeds creating a structure so that that culture can be uh, uh, um, reach uh, larger scales and be shipped internationally and so on so those are the projects that are important to address the issue of uh, lack of water and, and and improve our ability to use land that right now cannot be used for potatoes, for example, or rice. Okay. Um, I, got a, I got a final question I want to ask you all in sort of a lightning round because we only have a few minutes left. But I started out, I think I asked Bruno, what, what might be in my refrigerator five to 10 years from now? Um, my oldest grandchild is now five years old. And I'm curious, just in a few words, what's going to be in her refrigerator 50 years from now that maybe we can't even imagine today. Any thoughts on that? David? Uh, well, I, you know, I think uh, this relates to something that came up earlier, which is that, um, um, that this, that, you know, human diets evolved and actually Bruno just made that point as well. Um, and it continues to evolve and it evolves by a series of adjacent steps. You know, we, 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 there are things that we're accustomed to and we like now and we'll add to it and we have to sort of understand those foods as we go. And so I don't really know the direction. I don't know where it's going to end up um, uh, uh, because of those steps. I don't think that we can sort of target and say, well, it's, it's going to be cell-based meats or something. Um, I'd kind of be shocked if that was the case, actually. So, um, so I think that we, we can't answer that question. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, I just hope that at that point it, it's, it's, it's not animal based. Okay. Fair enough. Bruno. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Uh, as I said, I, I still think that we will not completely transition, uh, right away. I think that trend is going to continue. I think we will see, uh, more, uh, 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 traditional foods making its way in our diet. Uh, I think in the United States, we get exposed to foods from all over the world, we will see uh, things like what we're saying now, and uh, different types of cheeses that may have a mix of milk protein and some other added uh, uh, ingredients, for example, source of fiber, or increase the vitamin content, and, and, and things of that, very creative, very innovative foods in that sense. But it's still that uh, uh, um, link the consumer to things that they have already eaten. I do think, and, and, and that's part, partly wishful thinking, that we will see more local, locally grown foods and a diversity of foods being grown uh, locally. I think both things are going to happen. And with technology and uh, improvement, our ability to ship uh, uh, foods directly to consumer, I really think okay. that that's going to have a huge impact on our diet as well. Maybe, maybe we can grow some cassavas in Western New York. I, I'm afraid that's not going to happen, but I would yeah. love to see it. <laughs> and just, a, just a quick last word. My, my granddaughter's refrigerator 50 years from now. Dan, what's your guess? You know what? I don't, I don't want to guess what's in your daughter's refrigerator exactly, but what I really yeah. hope for her and for her family and for future generations to come, that it's a whole lot of real food. Um, I tend to agree with Bruno that we're going to continue to eat foods that are familiar to us. I think we will eat versions of those foods that contribute to people's wellness. I think that will be a very, very big theme in the future. But whatever food it is that we, whether it's plant-based or whether it's some meat still left in our diets, um, you know, my North Star is a quote from Thomas Edison. It was sort of an om ominous, ominous warning from 1903, where he said, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest patients in the care of the human frame and diet and in the cause of prevention and disease. This is the typical prototypical food as medicine quote, right? And we have a topic for, for the next... Uh, next yeah, I, I just think that people should, you know, value their food and whatever that food is that's in their fridge, as long as they place tremendous value on its ability to transform the health and the healthfulness of them, their families and, and our planet, I think it'll be great food and probably delicious. We're going to end on that very wise note. I use that word purposely. <laughs> Uh, it's time to wrap up, and as we do, I want to I want to note 
on another topic that today is December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, to veterans and active service members who may have been watching, thank you for your service. Your defense of liberty makes it possible for all of us to have enjoyed the relative luxury of spending an hour talking about food. Uh, thank you again to David Littman, Bruno Javier, Dan Wise for being on our panel today. Your contributions were terrific. And thanks to our sponsors, Arm Brewster Capital Management, Canandaigua National Bank, and Lamar Advertising. To our viewers, if you too would like to um, contribute to the support of the Rochester Beacon, uh, please consider making a donation before December 31st during our annual news match campaign. The campaign matches dollar for dollar up to $1,000 per individual donation. And it is the single most important source of our operating funds. Go to the website rochesterbeacon.com and click on donate to double the impact. And finally, if you haven't already done so, please sign up for the free Rochester Weekly Review email. It'll come to your inbox every Thursday, precisely at 11 a.m. with all our newest stories, also at rochesterbeacon.com. I now hand it back to Karen Heider, who produced this event. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Peter, and thanks to everybody for joining us. A recording of today's event will be posted on the Beacon website tomorrow. This is our final event of 2021. We're already working on plans for next year, so keep an eye out out for news of our first event of 2022. Have a great rest of your day and stay healthy. See you next year.